I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, and I have the pleasure today of interviewing Select Board member Adam Dash. I think we all were a little surprised in the last week or so when Adam announced that he has chosen not to run for re-election to the Select Board. Adam, however, has served for two terms and has done some wonderful things for the town in many different areas. So today we're going to have an opportunity to chat with him, look at some of the things he's accomplished, look forward into maybe some of the challenges of the town, and just get a sense of why he's made this decision. Adam, welcome today. Well, thank you. Um, nice to see you. Let's start right off. Why did you decide not to run for a third term? I think it's, I think I was pretty clear early on. I, I was interviewed by Joanne, I think on this very uh, station <laughs> early on. And I said, you know, three, one three-year term is not enough time to accomplish what you really want to do. Two terms, six years is more like it. Um, longer may be necessary, but I was never intending to be someone who is going to be here for decades. Um, but I, I think it should rotate through and people should take their turn. And um, I felt like this was a good time for me and for the town to sort of uh, move aside and let someone else handle it. It's, as you know, uh, we just finished with the last three years has been very, very difficult. <laughs> for COVID. Um, I think I'm probably the only select board person whose election got moved in the middle of it from member from April 2020 to June 2020 when I got reelected. So I served three years and two months. And then I had a term that was two years and 10 months. So I don't know if that's a record or something, but it's probably, um, it's been a very odd existence uh, this past uh, three-year term, but I'm very um, happy that I did this. It was a, it's been a great experience. All right, excellent. Well, let's go right into the topic of COVID. Uh, that certainly, as you noted, has disrupted all of our lives in ways that at least you were chuckling. So we've already got to the point where we can smile a little bit about some of the disruptions. Talk about, however, what it's been like to be a select board member during COVID, which now is almost at three years. Yeah, I mean, being on the select board, is, it's been a tough second. It's sort of a tale of two terms, really. I served in 2017, and my term was supposed to run out April of 2020. I ended up going to June of 2020, but right in the thick of things. And then this whole second term has been mostly COVID. So it's been a it's been a difficult time. I mean, as you know, there are two years where we didn't meet in person at all. And I, I give credit to everybody on the town for being able to pivot very quickly, like within a matter of weeks, to pivot from doing things the way we've done for 150 years to suddenly doing them completely differently by pretty much fairly seamlessly and um, operating. But it's not the same when you're in the select board room, the three of you as opposed to three of you on a screen where everyone has to talk and then you go back through the discussion and you, there's, no, there's no body language, there's no you know, chatting before and after about how are the kids doing. It's sort of you get on the meeting, you do your thing, you leave the meeting and then you can't speak outside of the meeting. So it's, a, it's just sort of a, it's not as satisfying and, it take, and the meetings as you may have noticed took a lot longer because we all had to sort of go through this taking turns of talking as opposed to just looking at each other. Are you okay with this? Yeah, I, I like this. Yep, this is good. You'll notice our meetings now move a lot better that we're in person. But, you know, we got our job done and we persevered. And that was the important thing. We, it's been tough. It's been tough because we had the serious budget issues, obviously, due to COVID. You know, changes in um, revenues were way down. People weren't going to restaurants. We weren't getting meals taxes. People weren't... Uh, buying new cars. We weren't getting excise taxes. I mean, we weren't getting parking meter revenue because people weren't going places. It was recreation programs were closed. So we weren't getting money off of that. Um, and then the ARPA money came, was coming. Then it wasn't, then it was, then it wasn't, then it was being restricted like this, then it wasn't, then it was being restricted like that. So it was very tough to budget it. Meanwhile, you know, we had a standing meeting with the health director uh, with West Gen, just trying to make sure that we were keeping people safe. And obviously, there were a lot of people who were happy with our decisions and a lot of people who were unhappy with our decisions about masking and such. But, you know, we did what we thought was best and um, it didn't make everybody happy, but I think it, it got us through. And while we're not out of the woods entirely, I think we're clearly way better off than we were. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, just, just a quick follow up, this idea of the virtual meetings. What do you see as the future for virtual? As you mentioned, we are coming back in person, which has been great. It's, as you say, it's so nice just to be in the same room with people. Yeah. But have we opened a door that now we're going to keep open in some way? Well, I would hope so. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we talked 
list on the select board for a while pre-COVID about should we allow you know, people to participate remotely, should they be able to call in. We, we piloted this OWL device in the middle of the table on a couple of our select board meetings to see how that would work. And then we just sort of were thinking about it. And then COVID happened and we all had to do it instantly. Um, and it actually, we had larger attendance at our meetings. And I think we still do because we're hybrid than we used to. People didn't have to get a babysitter to come down to town hall to talk about something they were concerned about. Um, I'm not a fan of the entire everything being 100% remote, as I said earlier, I think it's a little unwieldy for committee members, but to allow the public to, as the select board does now, we're in the room, you can either come in the room and speak to us live, or you can come in uh, remotely, and we have a big screen TV in the select board room, and we've now outfitted the art gallery at the Homer building for that, and other committees are doing that, and we're looking to outfit more. The emergency order expires in March that allows these remote meetings, so this is really up to the state legislature. If they go back to the old, you know, open meeting law without the exceptions, then I don't know how much we'll be able to do. But I certainly hope that the legislature will continue sort of these COVID um, exceptions because it's, I think, been more allowing for more participatory democracy from people. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it's been a change and a lot of it actually has been positive. All right, let's go back to, you ran a second time, you wanted to uh, continue some accomplishments. Uh, what do you feel that you have accomplished and is there anything left that you wish you could have uh, <laughs> done but didn't quite make it? I was kind of surprised to be honest with you how quickly some of the things I, I ran on to come into office to do were accomplishable in the first term, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I thought the committees were overwhelmingly male and white a lot of the boards and committees in town. I spent a lot of time going through resumes and recruiting people. And I think we got a lot more diversity and a lot more uh, women on committees. Uh, I think the um, things like the McLean land, which had been zoned for 20 years for development and not been done. The community path, which has been going on since I heard the seventies and hasn't been <laughs> built uh, with the, with the tunnel under the tracks behind the high school at Alexander Avenue and getting both of those uh, moving again. Um, I mean, obviously, everything I say here takes more than just me, but they also take an advocate. And I think I came in, I ran on some of these things, and I pushed. And surprisingly, I didn't receive a whole lot of resistance. I just don't think a lot of people were pushing on some of these things. Um, getting Belmont Light to get green energy. I think when I came into office, there were single digits in, in percentage in, in green energy. And this year, we're going to get to, I believe, 100% um, of, our, of our power from green energy sources. And then by uh, doing the electrification program, if we get everybody electrified and we get 100% green, we're in way ahead of the curve from a lot of communities who don't have municipal light departments. So we, we're leveraging that advantage, um, creating things like the Structural Change Committee and having those someone to work on those, uh, the Business Study Committee to make Belmont more business friendly were things that I ran on and pushed. Um, getting I took the lead in negotiating those cannabis host agreements with those two entities. Obviously, COVID sort of pushed everything, you know, later than I would have liked, but they're still on track. Um, you know, and there are a lot of things, some of them were very visible, obviously getting a lot of those capital projects you were mentioning done. I mean, you remember back in the day with the mega group and we were talking about prioritizing yes. the, the Underwood pool and the Wellington and the DPW and the police station and the fire stations and the high school and the rink and the library and with pretty much other than the rink now, we've done them or they're in the in the works. So I think that's a pretty, and again, not just me and not just during my term, but the fact that these things have been, that when I took office, some of these things were not even, you know, it didn't even have a path, like the like the uh, the police station or the station DPW. DPW they had nothing. And, and I thank you, uh, honestly, for really working <laughs> on those hard and getting them done in a very clever and cost-effective manner. I think we're in really really uh, the town owes you a great debt on that. Well, thank you. But you make the perfect point, And that is that these projects needed advocacy and they just needed someone, you or me or somebody else to step up and say, hey, this is important. How do we get this done? Yeah, it's so, funny. Yeah, well, you know how it goes. When I first got elected, it was funny. I was up there meeting with folks at town hall and, um, and I was just sort of mentioning something offhand. And I said, oh, you know, it'd be nice if we like looked at this, maybe this, if we took a look at this, what do you think? And I just left. And then later, someone from the town minister's office sent me a whole big thing saying, okay, we researched it. We got all this information. I was like, no, 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 no. I wasn't asking you to do anything. I just, I just thought maybe this is something that we could talk about. 
but they'd actually done like, they're so efficient they actually took that as me telling them to do it which do it <laughs> i had to learn like to be careful what i say because actually yeah, yeah. you know right after you get elected you realize that actually people start listening to you more than they used to <laughs> and taking you more seriously so you actually have to be careful with it but uh, that also was great in that when you want to move something or you want to really get into it the staff at town minister's office has been excellent in um, sort of giving us the tools we need to um, you know, do the research and getting, if you need counsel involved, whatever, to make sure what we're doing is correct and proper and moving forward. Um, so it's, 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 it makes a life a lot easier working with competent, good people like that. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I, I had the same experience with DPW and police. As you, as you mentioned, that was a very unusual project, how we structured that. But we just got so much support from you know, the town treasurer and from the town administrator's office and, and council and everybody else really made it happen. It, as you say, it's a team effort. It's no one person, yeah. but yeah, we made it happen. And so that was great. Um, let's, let's stay on that theme a little bit. You know, we've heard a lot this past year about long-term planning and you and I have served together on the capital budget committee. Uh, we also served on the long-term planning, whatever committee, um, and here we are today. And as we look forward, you know, the good news is the library passed. The bad news is the rink didn't. But also, as you know, from capital budget, you know, we've started talking a lot about three of the elementary schools who were renovated now 25, almost 30 years ago. Uh, and even the Chenery that that for some of us, we still consider it the new Chenery is 25 years old and needs some major work to keep it up to par. What do you see going forward with these kinds of capital projects? You know, how are we going to fund them? How are we going to prioritize them? How are we going to deal with them as a town? Right. Well, and I'm on, now I'm on the cap comprehensive capital committee. So the new one. Uh, there and, you go. I, and I like the fact that what we've done is we've taken, the, as you know, the old capital budget committee, which was more in a lot of ways reactive to departmental requests mm -hmm. and prioritizing them and all and making this more of a long term thing where we're there, where obviously in the first year we just created the committee. So it's not going to happen for the budget cycle now, right. but for next year to start working on um, a process with a long term capital plan, like a lot of other towns have. And this is something we've been working on before the Collins Center report came in, but um, is one of those Collins Center things that we uh, should be having an eye on the long term figure out what we need, when things are going to break. You know, you know pretty much when you need a new police car, you know, and we do budget things like fire engines and such because you know those. Uh, we've always done that. And we save for them and then pay for them. But things like buildings, roofs, HVAC systems, they all have a lifespan. And what we need to do is put markers out on those dates and then fig come up with a figure of how much that we think those will cost and then sort of backfill so we get the money there and take a certain percentage of the budget and make sure we put it towards long-term capital things. Because as you said, it's great to build all these new buildings, but you constantly need to keep them up or we're just gonna be in the same place we were with buildings that are failing. And you saw it with the roads until we, that the roads got to the point where they were deferred so long that they had to be replaced. They couldn't just be ground and repaved. And that just costs more, takes longer, and we can do fewer roads per year until we had the override in 2015. So. It's very, very um, important because, as you know, capital never stops. Yeah. Capital needs never stop. Something always breaks. Something always gets old. And when we finish all these buildings, you know, like you said, look, then you turn around. Oh, my goodness. Chenery and Butler and Burbank and all of them and Winbrook. And they're all getting older. Town Hall. I mean, you think some of these repairs were recent. But when you think back, as you said, they're really not. The 90s. Um, and the high school, you know, it's, is a complex building that needs a lot of, a lot of um, maintenance for, you know, done correctly, just like the Underwood pool is one of those that has a very prescribed way of dealing with it and uh, to keep it from, you know, becoming a problem you know, structurally in the future. So we are, I think, on the right path. We need the discipline to stay on that path and to put the money aside and not touch it and make sure it's there for when X roof or Y heating system goes. So we're not stuck with some boiler suddenly going and then breaking the budget at that time. And that's, that's just, I think, what you would do in your personal life. You know, you put money aside towards college for kids and for buying a house or buying a car. I mean, whatever that is, put the money aside and you know you'll need it. You know you'll need it. Right, right. Um, let's go from capital now and dive into, you mentioned the Collins Center, long-term finances. 
you know, we keep talking about the cliff. We keep talking about running out of money. We had an unsuccessful uh, override. What do you see going forward for the town finances? You served for a number of years on the Warren Committee before getting on the select board. And then, of course, as a select board member, you've also been back onto the Warren Committee. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the structural deficit still exists. The Collins Center we brought in to give us sort of a, a roadmap on how to manage that because other towns, you know, man, seem to get through. Um, some are, some do worse than we do, some do better, but we have whatever, 95% uh, residential tax base, which is not the same as a lot of our towns around us. We don't have 128 with big buildings on them. So how can we do that without losing the character of the town is sort of that, that needle we've got to thread. Uh, it's it's not easy, but I think the Collins Center put forth some really good recommendations, a lot of them, and some of them very vociferously, and we need the courage to do them. And some of them are going to be very, very hard. Um, as you see, the one right now with the appointed treasurer to make it from elected to appointed was one of them. And I've, if you've been watching select like board meetings, I've been wanting to do that like now, like in as in town meeting in November, my colleagues wanted to put it off to the January town meeting, which is fine. Um, because the, as long as it's before the April election, but <laughs> the um, it, I think that's a crucial thing to make the financial management team uh, make it full of people who are actually you know vetted and qualified and hired based upon their recommendations, whether they live in town or not, as opposed to just hoping someone in town with the skills runs and wins. Um, we're lucky that Floyd Carmen has for many years, but that's not a permanent solution to the issue. No. But there are a lot of other ones, uh, making the Board of Assessors appointed instead of elected, um, having the Warrant Committee and the um, Select Board in the Town Warrant control the budget and the school committee less. So not simple things to do to implement. They're simple to say. They're not simple to do um, because people, you know, people will think, oh, the Select Board is just trying to gather power. I can tell you as someone who is stepping off the Select Board, right? <laughs> this has, I have no dog in this fight about getting power or somehow trying to you know, because I'm leaving the select board. So I can tell you, I still think these are good recommendations because the, the decentralization of the town, what Ralph Jones used to call about the silos of control yeah. in this town, yeah. where you know, there are so many elected bodies all with their finger in things that we can't, it really hampers our ability to, in a unified fashion, get things done. You know, I've done these talks with Ellen O'Brien Cushman, the clerk, with like Boy Scout troops, Girl Scout troops, and the like, and, and kids at the Chenery on Civics Day. And I sort of title it Belmont, where everyone's in charge and no one's in charge. Because, because, <laughs> so true. because there are all these elected bodies where everyone's in charge. But when it comes down to one thing, there's really no one person who can make it happen. And it's very difficult because you have to go around. And I've been pretty good at it. I think you go to the library trustees, you talk to them, you go to the assessors, you talk to them, you go to the school committee, you talk to them and get everyone on the same on the same path. But it's it's not always possible. And it takes a lot of effort and time. And it's sometimes doesn't work at all. Um, and that really, I think, is a negative to the town. It's a very difficult for us to get on the right path when I think now we know what it is because the Collins Center has laid, laid it out for us and they've got no particular ax to grind. Um, and there are things that we do that no other town does and there's really no good reason for it other than just we do it that way. Um, but doing things differently than we've been doing for decades is going to be a tough sell, but I think everyone needs the courage to push through and do it or or else this is just going to continue to be a problem. Right. And I think the uh, elected light board, you know, morphing from the select board acting as the light board, as they did when, when I was on the select board, um, morphing into an elected light board of people who really have some expertise. You know, we're just in the beginning stages of it, but thus far, it seems like it's been a good thing. So... Yeah, well, I mean, we elected good people and most a lot of so many of them came from the Light Board Advisory Committee. And as you know, I was not in favor of doing that change um, because I think that is creating yet another silo of control. And I think that goes okay. it goes completely against what the Collins Center recommendations are, which is creating yet another elected body. I understand the rationale for it, but, um, you know, we were doing pretty well, I think, as the select board getting with that we adopted the purchase power policy, which I pushed for. Uh, we hired a good general manager. We've uh, got it to a uh, good to 100% green energy, pushing people to electrification. We, I think, we got we put uh, Belmont Light in a really good place when we turned it over to this new group, which has been doing great. You know, mm -hmm. clearly they're they're competent, good people. Uh, I always get concerned when you have something that important um, that 
anybody could get elected and and blow it up right. and that's a it, it it's a concern but uh you know i trust the belmont voters and so i agree far, yeah there are pluses well. and minuses absolutely right i i think probably your fail safe is that there's five members harder for, yep. for one person to to blow it up as you say um well we'll see how it works you know like everything it's there'll be a trial period and we'll see see what happens um so far right, so good though yeah uh, a little bit of a lighter question. Uh, what about being a select person? Did you enjoy? Yeah, it's funny. I got elected as a select man, and then I am leaving yeah, as a select right. board member. Just a person. <laughs> yeah, we made the change while I was in office. I mean, I enjoyed working with people. I enjoy working with staff. I enjoyed being close to the center of things because you're always. I was on the zoning board, and I was on the uh, you know community preservation act study committee, and all these other different groups, the Underwood Pool Building Committee. And then on the Warren Committee, in every place, you get a little closer to sort of where the where things or decisions are made. But to be on the select board, you're you're right in it. And I like being in the mix uh, and being uh, you know involved in that. And I also like going to events and you know talking to people. And then you know you go to things like I've gone to like the Diwali event, or I go to the LGBTQ plus events, and um, they're very happy that someone from the town government is there to give greetings talking to veterans at the various events, like the Purple Heart Ceremony, getting to speak at those, um, getting to give the speech on Memorial Day and on uh, Martin Luther King breakfast as the chair. You know, those are just, and marching in the parade and things like that are just great things that are just such Americana and such democracy at its most basic. And, you know, people calling me with an issue and being able to solve it has been um, great. It's been a really interesting and one of the more fun things I've ever done. Obviously, COVID, um, put a big cloud over a lot of that because we didn't have those events. So I feel like out of the six years, I really only did four of them because the other two, I was you know, doing it all out of my attic for, you know, like everybody else. And it wasn't the, uh, wasn't such a, as much fun, but it was important work. I mean, what we were doing during the height of COVID was life and death stuff. And I think it was, we had a really good group. Um, I've been fortunate to serve with during the crisis that have been really, you know, sober, serious and, you know, willing to do the right thing, even if it politically wasn't necessarily always the popular thing at the moment. Yeah, and you make a good point, you know, the, the popular thing versus the hard choice that needs to happen. And and that's where the buck stops with the select board. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people didn't want the mask mandates or shutting down town hall or going remote. But, you know, we felt we had to do what we had to do to save lives. And I think we did. I mean, Belmont, I think, fared, you know, unfortunately, people died. But um, I think overall, I think we fared, we fared oh, yeah. as well as could be expected under the circumstances, which nobody saw coming. Um, it was no, a, we did do well. It was a very, very. It's been a very difficult time. What advice would you give to your successor? Well, I would hope somebody, hope people who are running are running because they want to do the work and not because they think this is, as you know, this is some sort of blue ribbon panel where you get to go to parties and people recognize you in restaurants because <laughs> no it's it's really not you know uh, it, <laughs> i mean well, this is a working board this is not some blue ribbon panel like some some towns the select board really just meets every now and then sets policy and then they have a town manager that does all the work you know we have a town administrator which is weaker than a town manager and we have a select board that is stronger than those other boards we do a lot of the work we are the liquor licensing authority and the board of survey and the parks commissioners in addition to all the other things that we do. And there's there's a lot. And then we sit on other committees. People think, oh, they meet only twice a month on Mondays. Well, we have a lot of other committee meetings in between. So 7.30 in the morning, and then I'll have a select board meeting till 10 or 11 at night. I mean, it's not small work. And I'll tell you, you know, if you're looking for fame and fortune, uh, A, it doesn't really pay. And B, <laughs> you know, half the town doesn't know what, that there is a select board. And when you leave the, the confines of Belmont, they've never even heard what a select board is. So there's really not, none of that's really, it, it's a matter of really wanting someone who's serious and is going to do the work and who just doesn't want the job for the title. Um, because that's just, that's not what this is. Do you have any thoughts on, and this is the, the perennial question, on motivating qualified citizens to step up not just select board, but even into these other committees that you mentioned, you know, zoning and uh, warring committee, CPA, all of it. Um, how do we get more qualified people interested and willing to serve? Yeah, we've been doing that. Um, I've been doing that since I got on, as I was saying earlier, trying to recruit people. 
uh, talking to people to recruit people who I thought would be good or people who I've observed at town meeting when they speak or when they talk and come to a committee as a member of the public and speak. I'm like, oh, that person's really good. We should grab her and put her on, you know, X committee. And sometimes, you know, when the select board member asks you to serve, you know, people are honored and they're willing to do it. Uh, and I think we've had some pretty good luck. And as far as running for office and such, I would like to see someone who's had um, experience with the budget and experience, experience on various things in town. It doesn't have to just be the Warren Committee. It could be, and I mean, budget's involved in a lot of things, but to have served on something, CPA committee or one of the larger committees, planning board or the, you know, the capital committees or some, or even on a building committee, you know, people who have been involved in running budgets and dealing with town matters um, and preferably having served on town meeting and seeing some of this stuff for a while, because I, I, the select board, I think, is something that should be more of a capstone to your work in town government, not something you just jump right into, because it, it is even when you've been on the other side of the table at the select board and you know how this is, you know, go to warrant committee and testify in front of the select board and all. And you know the budget inside and out. When you get elected and you're on the other side of the table and the cameras are on and the decision has to be voted on at that moment, it's very different. It's very different. And people are lobbying you to vote yes or lobbying you to vote no. And you're going to make half the town mad no matter what you do. And, yeah, right. <laughs> and it's and it's sort of tough to just sort of make sure that you you know, stay centered, that you keep in mind what's best as you when you get sworn in, you know, what's best for the, the town and its inhabitants. And I always do that and make sure I make the right decision. I figure if people don't like it and they'd want to vote me out, that's fine. Um, I serve at the pleasure of the people. And if they don't want me there anymore, that's fine. I've got other things in my life I can be doing. You know, that, that, that's that got a lot less time on my, a lot more time in my hands wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad thing. So, um, but you do what I think is right. And people respect you for that. I've had people say, you know, I didn't vote for you or I don't agree with how you voted, but I respect how you came to your decision. And that's all you can expect. I think that's, that people understand why you did what you did. And I think people understand the select board's not a bunch of wild, crazy people. We're very sober, serious people who really think things through before we vote. Right, yeah, well said. People don't understand the enormous amount of work and deliberation that, that goes into the job, every single item. Oh yeah, I mean, I spend every weekend before we have a select board meeting going through the packet and reading through everything yep. and marking them up and asking questions before the meeting. And the, the meeting's just the, the tip of that iceberg. There's a That's lot the of work. That, right. Yeah, there's a lot of work that, that goes on behind the scenes that you don't see. We make it look easy because we've all read our materials and we're prepped. Yeah. Um, but if you didn't do that, I don't know how you'd do this job. It would I mean, be chaotic. Of, yeah, you, you really have to um, be up on everything. And it's hard. You know, there's a lot of things to be up on <laughs> in right. this town. It's a smallish town, but there's a lot going on. It sure is. Yeah. So now that you've identified all the time that you spent being a select board member that now you're going to have his free time, what's next for you? Any ideas? That's a good question. I don't know, because I've always done a lot of service. I mean, I was before on the select board, um, you know, I was on the Warren Committee for about nine years. Before that, I was chair of the Somerville Chamber of Commerce for four years. Before that, I was president of the Somerville Homeless Coalition for four years. I've always done, because my office is in Somerville, so I've been doing the work there. So, I mean, a lot of there's always been this big chunk of my life that's sort of been a public service piece. I don't know. I have to find what what's right. I'm thinking of running for town meeting just to keep my hand in things and to make sure oh, things yeah. like the budget and stuff that I've been working on actually get through um, and keeping abreast of things. Uh, I have no desire to, you know, go on some major committee anytime soon. <laughs> like, right. Thank you so much. Um, we do look forward to the next few months. You're not gone yet. You still got a lot of work to do. So no checking out yet. Oh, no, there's a lot to do in the next four months. We got a budget to put together. It's a lot Absolutely. going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm Anne-Marie Mahoney. Thank you for being with us in Belmont Journal. And until the next time, have a great day.